okay so uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, asset colloquium uh, which is titled as archives as public space uh, the interplay of science administration art and history uh, by mr venkat srinivasan uh, from national center for uh, biological sciences tfr bengaluru uh so, so uh, i must uh, say a word before i uh, kind of uh, go further uh, this talk was actually planned uh, by uh, our registrar having commanded george antony some time back in uh, april this year uh, and in a slightly different format the idea at that time was uh, basically uh, to sensitize the tf our scientists and staff members in general about the importance of archives and uh, also to kind of foresee what kind of potential material that uh, they usually work with uh, as archive potential material uh, while they are carrying out their research or work or whatever so this was uh, the main kind of motivation uh, in april uh, and that is how we wanted to of course have this uh, colloquium organized at that time but uh, as you all know we couldn't of course do it and the next best being uh, uh, like here online and today we have this colloquium uh, scheduled uh, uh, in this particular online format uh, so uh, with that a few words i would now request uh, george uh, to kind of say a few more words on what was actually perceived at that time and uh, also go ahead and introduce today's speaker for me yeah good evening to all Uh, archive at first i'm sure to many would sound just like history uh, which is true in its uh, basic sense and uh, if you consider if that is so we may wonder how such an activity can be connected to science and in particular to tfr which uh, mainly deals with fundamental research in science uh, this i thought would be a lot of question mark in the people of in my sense for the administrative people because they are the ones who actually maintain records and they probably don't know the importance of these records so it was my idea that it would be a good idea to sort of uh, talk to them and tell them what uh, is archives is about and how important it is for them to preserve these documents which at one time would actually have great value much more great value than they actually see uh, but then of course the format changed and um, uh, as we see that we do not have too many people from the administrative uh, section who are attending this colloquium which i uh, which i hope the next time will be a good and a the normal course where we can have large number of people attending uh, uh saying that uh, the basic um, meaning of archives as the dictionary says it's a collection of historical documents or records providing information about a place institution or a group of people as regards to tfr which is celebrating its 75th year it means much more a proper record of evolution of tfr could actually come out of the archives that we could maintain and it could be very interesting to each one of us having such a legacy that we hold and if we could arrange the records in a visually appealing way i'm sure it could become a treasure of knowledge from which each one of us can draw inspiration for whatever reasons i had a chance to visit the archives maintained at ncbs and of course i do i have visited the archives that we have in tfr kolaba also in ncbs i noticed that all the records have been stored very well and they have categorized in different topics and you know time and things like that so that you can easily retrieve them and if anyone is really interested to know about uh, things they can actually look at this and wicket he had come here to tfr and he had actually gone through uh, many of the documents that we maintain in the administrative uh, section which is basically just almost you could say almost you know uh, stored but also dumped uh, in a totally a dusty atmosphere and he went through all of them the archivist archivist that we have in tfr kolaba and they managed to get a lot of things and I, I, it is it is going to be a continued effort that we can get more of things of it and i'm sure each of this record when you look at it in the past we say a lot about tfr and similarly ncbs also done their part at uh, at ncbs they have taken a lot of things from here related to ncbs their history and how uh, ncbs was formed what all the approvals got from different uh, uh, people around and also they have managed to collect a lot of articles of uh, you know which has some value historically and which i'm sure which uh, the members there in cbs or the students see it they will 
definitely have something to think about it. And imagine if the, what the treasure that we could create if TIFR collected all that we had in the past, categorized them, uh, it, and every event that you know TIFR went through, it would be such a big treasure, I'm sure, which would be an envy to everybody. And we have things that we have done, we have contributed to the nation. Imagine if we could actually see the first digital computer that we presented to the country. Unfortunately, a lot of people have gone through and tried to find out where it went, but we couldn't find it where it was, where it is. Probably someone has sold it off as a, uh, you know, scrap. Uh, this is a, would be a very sad thing that could happen to many of the things that we have. I am imagining archives not as just a building. I'm imagining as a park where could, we could actually put things or at least actual things or the models which could actually you could walk around. Like you have a fossil park, you could even have an archive park for TFR. And uh, we have, we can do it. Hyderabad is one place we can actually probably create such a thing. Anyway, not going anymore, I would now uh, request Venkat to tell us more about his passion, that is archives, and it's important to an organization like ours. Before that, I would like to introduce uh, Venkat Srinivasan, who is a visiting researcher and archivist, archivist at uh, NCBS in Bangalore. He's part of the team that set up the archives at NCBS. He's also on board of Oral History Association of India and of the Commission on Bibliography and Documentation of the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science and Technology. Prior to this, he was a research engineer at SLAC, National Accelerator Laboratory, Stanford University. In addition to that, he's an important, he's an independent science writer with work in Atlantic Science, Scientific and American Online, Nautilus, Aeon, Wired, and the Caravan. I now hand you over to Venkat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. And uh, thanks for this lovely, very generous introduction. Um, and it's quite an honor to be part of this colloquium series, which has been on many decades now, has its own archive of sorts, you could argue. So um, uh, it's a thrill to be part of this conversation. So. And it probably is very different from the talks that this colloquium series and the, its uh, audience might have seen. So I hope you can just sit back with your beverage of choice and just uh, enjoy the ride. Um, for those, I just should make a disclaimer here first. Uh, as uh, uh, we talked earlier, the idea was to have a conversation in person. Um, and of course, since we can't do that, uh, this is sort of the my next best effort, but I'm hoping this can also start a dialogue uh, across the, the, the different campuses. Uh, a shout out just to let you guys know that the word art that I've included here was something that I was hoping to cover, uh, but I don't have enough material. So if you're here for the art, now's your moment to exit. So on that note, uh, but I'm really glad uh, the registrar talked about the archives as a park because I think really that's the focus of what I'm trying to do here, which is to sort of reimagine the archive as a public space. And it's something that we don't really don't do very often. So um, just a second, I don't know if I can, oops, yeah, okay. Um, you can see my slides, right? Just one yes, minute. yes. Okay, thank you. So just a quick word on acknowledgements and I'll come back to this later. First, um, Space and CBS um, have for sort of giving a certain freedom to experiment with ideas. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, speaking of ideas, uh, there's a software group that we work with uh, quite often over the last three, four years, uh, Janus through Servlots. And I'll be talking a little bit about the work that we have done and um, around thinking about the meaning of data. Um, and uh, most importantly, perhaps the energy that we've received from all the student interns who have been working in the archives over the last two and a half years. We've had over 45 students and I'll talk about them a little later. Uh, another just quick disclaimer, um, this is an edited version of previous presentations. So there will be various iterations of what you're hearing from me somewhere on the web or in some other, if you've heard some of this before, I ask for your indulgence. So um, I'm gonna start with three stories, all right? And I'll try and connect them about why I'm talking about these three stories. So story one is about um, this mall that you're looking at, which is in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And it was called the Bambergers Mall. It doesn't exist anymore. This is in the United States uh, on the East Coast of the US. And this is, uh, these are images from the early 1900s. Now, um, malls were relatively new at the time. And the Bambergers was perhaps one of the biggest and they sold pretty much everything. And if you can see that, you will see that just the sixth floor sells everything from um, rugs to carpets to actually a two-story home. I'm not entirely sure what that meant, but anyway. Um, but uh, the proprietors or the people who ran this, uh, Louis Bamberger and I think his sister, uh, Caroline, they, they made a ton of money, right? And um, then they decided to go ahead and sell it. 
This was in the uh, 1920s, if I remember correctly. And uh, here's an image of Louis Bamberger and Caroline Bamberger, um, who I believe was his sister. Um, and uh, they sold it as at a fairly good time. I think it was in the late 1920s and just before 1929, which uh, those of you who you know probably are familiar with that time of history would know that was when the Great Depression sort of really set in. Um, so uh, heartbreak for a lot of people, but Louis Bamberger had made his money. He was safe. And so he and his family decided that they wanted to invest their money into something. And they thought they'll reach out to someone who perhaps knew a little bit. Uh, so through their lawyers, if I uh, remember correctly, they reached out to someone who could probably take this forward. Um, and you know, they had money, they had money and they were trying to figure out what to do with it. And they reached out to this uh, gentleman named Abraham Flexner, again, a name that maybe some of you are familiar with if you had anything to do with uh, the field of medical uh, education or medicine. Now, Abraham Flexner is what I call sort of a yesteryear McKinsey consultant. And I mean this, of course, a little jokingly, uh, because uh, before he was asked to work on this report called the Medical Education Report, uh, he had been hired to look at the state of education in the United States. He was hired to look at the state of prostitution in Europe. So he was fairly involved in a variety of different questions in policymaking. And he perhaps is most well known for this particular report, which was published in 1910, uh, called the Medical Education in the United States and Canada. It's a fairly verbose title, but uh, most people are familiar with this report as the Flexner report. And it's something that, you know, if you just, you know, go on your online search platform and just type Flexner, you'll probably see the word report come after it. Um, and this was pivotal in thinking about medical education in the US and Canada, and actually was pivotal across the world after that. You know, it became a template of sorts to think about medical education. Now, they reached out to Abraham Flexner in, with the hope that perhaps they will set up a hospital. That was the intent for Louis Bamberger and the family. Now, Flexner at this time, we have to sort of contextualize what was, what was going on when they were reached, when um, the Bambergers reached out to him, because this is the 1920s and 30s. And um, in the early 20s, Flexner had started thinking a little bit about this was soon after World War I. And he had started to think a little bit about what does it mean um, you know, to live in this world, which, you know, as he says, is it not a curious fact that in a world steeped in irrational hatreds and so on and so forth, you know, in this crazy world, there is this, you know, there are some people who detach themselves wholly and to the extension of knowledge, to the cure of disease, to the amelioration of suffering, just as though fanatics were not simultaneously engaged in spreading pain, ugliness and suffering. It's a lovely little quote. And he went on to publish this in the Harper's in 1939, which again is available for everyone to see if they haven't seen it. And it was titled The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. So when the Bambergers reached out to him, uh, Flexner probably had a few different ideas. He was like, you know, if not, you know, instead of hospital, why not build something that would sort of uh, speak to this particular sort of concern of his, a place for basic research perhaps. And so he suggested and they agreed. And so what was eventually built was the Institute for Advanced Research at Princeton, New Jersey. Again, a place that is perhaps very familiar to many people at the IFR. Um, and this is an old image uh, of the center, a uh, couple of you know, very, very famous names. Of course, Einstein is perhaps the most famous person who was there, but there's so many others. Um, um, and the person in this, I think, if I remember right, I think second from left, you know, basically next to Einstein is, is Flexner. Um, this is now the, the usefulness of useless knowledge, the title that I've mentioned there, is something that is actually still very relevant. This is an image from 2017. I'm going to have the fortune of visiting them. And this is uh, this was a book that has been republished um, recently. And again, you can find the text on the web. So uh, Flexner, in his uh, sort of statement of what he was looking for, right? Um, about what he thought when he proposed the creation of the center, said this, right? He said that the institution should be small, that its students and staff or scholars should be few, the administration should be inconspicuous, inexpensive, and subordinate, that the members of the teaching staff, while freed from the waste of time involved in administrative work, should freely participate in decisions involving the character, quality, and directions of its activities, so on and so forth. But most importantly, that its subjects should be fundamental in character and that it should develop gradually. Um, this was what Flexner was saying. Now, what you're looking at here is not from Abraham Flexner, neither is it from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. What you're looking at here actually is the proposal document for the National Center for Biological Sciences, the center of TIFR in Bangalore. This is from 1991 or maybe late 80s, early 90s. Um, pretty much everything that you see here has just been taken verbatim and I've been tr trying to track this down for the last few years. If anyone in this audience knows about it, I'd be very grateful to figure out how this quote was picked up because it's not easy to find this quotation. Um, and 
Obeyed Siddiqui, because I can't, I'm not sure if anyone else was involved in this particular conclusion writing. Um, basically removed, there's, uh, I'm trying to find where my mouse is. Oh, there it is, yeah. So it says, you know, over con contemporary academic conditions, right about here is where I think Flexner had said in the United States or in America, and they just removed that because everything else seemed to fit just fine, right? So it's, it's basically just taken as it is because it seemed to fit just fine, you know, 60 years later almost, or actually half a century later. So uh, we looked at this and we sort of, you know, we placed it in a variety of different stories. So we, we see that, you know, every archival object can have these multiple interpretations. So we, we see this as, as, a, as a way to try and think about space, but we also see it as a way to think about what kinds of communities, because if you go back and see, there's a conversation here about how the administrative staff should be inconspicuous or inexpensive. So there's this sort of almost hierarchical sort of thought around who the scientist is and who the scientist isn't. And this is something that, you know, we've sort of probed a little bit in a story that we put together in, um, which is available for people to see in the archives website. So this was story one, where we're just trying to say that every archival object, however benign, can have multiple narratives that emerge from it. So story two, and I thought I'll just, you know, give a shout out to TIFR, which has turned 75 this year. And this is something that we, uh, just, just a matter of curiosity, I was looking through the old annual reports to see what I could find. And I was thoroughly fascinated by this story, which I'm just gonna call the making and flying of a balloon. And I know it's been talked about in a couple of different academic texts. Um, and it's just an extraordinarily beautifully composed photograph of this balloon. And of course this was used for cosmic ray research. But if you just sort of break down the details, again, all of this is available in a couple of paragraphs tucked away in an annual report, for, which was published in 1976 for the first 25 years of the Institute. And you know, there's just an extraordinary amount of just data, right? And you start to see a little bit about how different kinds of people have to come together to do this thing that we call science, that it's not just the scientist, of course, you know, it, there's a whole bunch of technicians, you know, I've often wondered about, you know, how many of these people remain unacknowledged in a way, right? They, they're sort of so integral to the process, but we never quite capture what their involvement in this process is. And so this, these were some of the reasons why I entered this space. And it's, it's covered quite a bit in Steve Shapin's article, Invisible Science, where you know, he of course talks about the science at a McDonald's as his sort of starting point. And, but I think there is a lot of invisible science that happens at a place like TIFR. Um, and just putting some statistics out there. And I thought, you know, these are the kinds of things that archives can do, that they bring this invisibility out and sort of make it sort of visible to a larger world going forward. So next story, I just want to sort of go back a few years. Um, this is a place that I was based at, uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, which is a particle accelerator, which perhaps, again, you know, many of you at TIF have probably spent time with as well. And I'm going to go back into the 1970s and 1980s to uh, maybe till the early 80s and maybe early 70s uh, to a project called the Positron Electron Project or the PEP project. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this PEP project was one where they had a lot of uh, conversations around how to work with the machine operator. So the physicists would have a lot of um, contests, if you will, where they would work with the machine operators and they would work uh, with the, the fellow engineers and the scientists to try and sort of tweak the beam. So they were trying to figure out how to get better luminosity, uh, you know, trying to figure out a better result and so on and so forth. And you know, typically Fridays as it were, they would sort of just relax and uh, they would sort of uh, just look back at their results over the week. They would have music sessions and so on and so forth. So this, this sort of became like an unofficial way of doing science at the Institute where the scientists, the technicians, the engineers, the, the staff at large would just come together every Friday to do this. Um, they called the center Chateau Neuf, du, uh, I think it's called Chateau Neuf, Neuf du Pep. I apologize for my horrible French here, which was a play on the word Chateau Neuf du Pep uh, for the Positron Electron Project. Uh, they they like their wine. So this was a place that actually produced really, really good wine. And this is what they sort of you know made a board for this and set it up like this. Way, right? Now, uh, this uh, what they actually ended up doing though is they, they also started correct data as, as a part of this process. So each of these champagne bottles became part of a contest where if the machine operator who sort of delivers a particular luminosity, for instance, if they are able to attain a certain target, it would be a reward from, as in this case, from E. Patterson, Ewan Patterson, to Jim Turner. And this was a 1980 bottle of Cabernet. Um, and they would slap a label onto the bottle saying, you know, luminosity was this much and the December 1988. And they would stack the bottles in the control room. And this happened over and over again to a point where these bottles were just lined up across the control room. You know, through my oral history interviews, this is what I found out that they were doing and involved with. 
Um, the bottles in, eventually, by the way, had to be stashed away into a box because they were considered to be a seismic hazard. Um, but the point is, eventually, these bottles became so integral to their science uh, uh, because their logbook data, I mean, the, sorry, the data logbooks that they had were just too cumbersome to deal with. And they had to rely on notes from, you know, they had to have quick references. And so what they would do really is to go back to the back of the control room and look for some of these bottles to figure out what the beam was doing on a certain date. So the bottles became their de facto logbooks, right? So these, these champagne bottles, very expensive bottles, but just bottles as it were, uh, with their labels became their sort of, you know, catalog entry points. And from that, they would go into their logbooks to try and figure out what was going on. So um, keep in mind, of course, that they were also doing the science in the control room. There's an image from 1974 uh, from the machine control room um, around the time that the discovery of the JSI particle was done. Um, and I remember there was, uh, in my interview, they, they said that you know, one of the scientists had asked the other one to just go down to the local grocery store, which, you know, which still exists till this day, to get a crate of champagne because they, they've actually discovered something. And so this is some images from the logbooks at that point. So, uh, which is to say that there was some credible science being done along with all the wine that was being drunk. So, as I did these interviews, I mean, it came to light that, you know, these people who were involved in these gatherings were not just the scientists, but also a whole variety of people like Gene Alvarado, who was in the janitorial services at that time. And I think he might have retired recently, but he was still working when I was there. And he'd been at this for the last 40, 50 years. And when Gene rem remembers these meetings and gatherings, he also remembers, I mean, as it happens in these oral history interviews, he started talking a little bit about his own histories, about how he came to Slack and how he came as, as a young employee. And, uh, and he said that, you know, I also was there during the 1969 time period, you know, during the Vietnam War. And so when he started talking about these other events, I would, you know, sort of switch the conversation, right? I would ask him, you know, you know tell me, tell me what it was like, what were you doing during that time? And so he sort of just nonchalantly will say things like, well, you know, I just remember cleaning up the windows, you know, all the window shards that had been broken by the students after the protests. And this, and he just sort of brushed it off and went along with that. Right? So the, the point I'm trying to make here though, is that, you know, Gene Alvarado has its own, has his own small history connected to this thing that we call the Vietnam War or this thing that we call the American War, if you're in Vietnam. Um, and it's quite accidental, right? Every one of these events. And I always sort of go back to this Louis Kahn expression of how accidental our existences are and how full of influence by circumstance. And I think this is something that the archive tends to capture. Uh, what we have captured here is, is from a combination of an object, the champagne bottle, and an oral history interview that we conducted with Gene Alvarado, right? So I want to sort of wrap up with this one last, last, last story here before I get into the rest of the talk, which is, uh, which is something that I've shared quite often recently, but it's so much fun to share this one. Um, and this is a archival document which is sitting at the archives at NCBS. It has an ID, MS51111, as you can see at the bottom. Um, and it is a field note. And it's a field note by a scientist named Ajit Kumar, um, who's a re a recently retired, uh, an ecologist, to use a broad word. And uh, when we asked him what this is about, we asked him, you know, are you, do you have anything? He gave us this material. We asked him, what is it? And he said, well, he was studying the population of tree living mammals. And we were doing an interview with him at the time. And I was staring at this um, object and I was doing this interview, but honestly, perhaps you are as intrigued about it as I am. And you start to see these perforations in the back of this paper, right? And uh, so during this conversation, I asked him, well, you know, what are these perforations? They look like braille paper. And he said, yeah, they, it is braille. And so the conversation shifts again, as it did in Gene Alvarado's case. And we start to talk a little bit about why Ajit is writing on Braille paper. And Ajit, uh, again, sort of just brushes it off in a way and says that, well, you know, he was a starving uh, graduate student in the early 1980s when this paper was created. He needed good non-blotting paper because he was working on a field site uh, in the Anamalai Hills in the Nilgiris, where it was high humidity. He needed good paper. And it just so happened that a colleague of his was blind and perhaps devout because he had a copy of the Bible in Braille. And so um, in this case, what uh, Ajit and his colleagues asked him, you know, where did you get this Bible from? And they said, well, he got it from the United States. And so they said, why, why don't we try and reach out to the same church? And sure enough, they did to see whether they would get a copy of the Bible. And uh, they did. They got many, many copies of the Bible which they promptly used in some cases for field research, for, for shelf lining, for all sorts of things. Now, uh, I should add at this point that I mean, no dis I mean absolutely no disrespect to the church. In fact, I think they should be giving me a commission for how much I have sort of spoken on their behalf. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is that every archival document, now that you look at it again, every time that you start to stare at it again, you start to see how many different kinds of stories are embedded in it. 
that it's no longer just the story of the ecologist Ajit. It's no longer just the story of non-blotting paper, but it's also the story of you know, evangelism in the early 1980s. It's a story of you know, research chutzpah, if you will, in the early 1980s. So there are various sort of layers that you start to see in the material, and it's the job of the archive to make these layers visible for the future uh, storyteller. Yeah. So, uh, and this is important also because when you're in the middle of the story, as Atwood says here, it really isn't a story. It's, it's more of a confusion, it's a blindness, and it's only, only afterwards that you look back at it, that it starts to become like a story, uh, especially when you're telling it to yourself or someone else, as I am to you right now, looking back at some of these stories. And, but you know, if you're in the moment, as we all are in this pandemic, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a blindness, but you know, 20, 30 years from today, we will look back at this and we'll figure out ways to sort of tell this as a story. And this is something that happens routinely. So um, if you take nothing else away, I just want you to sort of take a couple of slides from now, which is that you know, through these stories that emerge from, uh, through the stories that emerge from them, the archives really do help us make sense of this past, present and future. Um, fairly liberal with the word story here. It could be any of these things that I have mentioned. It could be a script for a play. It could be a blog post. It could be a story in the sense of a, a, a fictional um, novel. Um, it could be a documentary. It could be a thesis. Uh, very often, you know, people visit the archive for all variety of things. I just yesterday we received a, a research request from a PhD student in the University of Waterloo who needed an image from the archives at NCBS because he wanted to use that in his thesis that included work uh, around Max uh, Delbrook. So you, you never know where people will get questions from. So uh, the, the construct that I'm trying to put forward here is that once we reimagine every person, place, and event, we can see the diverse sort of interpretations that exist. So Ajit Kumar is more than just a person who is a story of an ecologist. So every person has many stories. That Ajit is not just the ecologist, but he has these other sort of layers to him which start to unfold when you do these interviews and connect the dots. Um, the, the event or the experiment or the area of research um, called Tree Living Mammals that Ajit was involved in has many people, not just Ajit, but also the driver, the, the, the administrative staff who worked with him, the students who were his colleagues, and so many other people. And of course, the Bible in Braille, the document that we saw, is, is an extraordinary little, um, I mean, benign but extraordinary object that shows the various interpretations in a single little thing called an archival object. So every person, many stories, every story, many people, every record, many interpretations. This really is sort of the way I'm trying to sum this conversation up. So uh, what we try and constantly tell here is the archives are there to enable a diversity of stories. And I would perhaps go further, especially in this context and say, you know, the science archives illuminate the context and process of science that it goes so far it goes so much further than the journal article that eventually gets published as being the only visible record of science. And I think that's, that's quite a shame, right? And so we, we should sort of you know, look at this context in the process of doing science. And that's what we're hoping to sort of uh, push forth here through the presence of archives as a public space. Um, quick uh, slides, just gonna walk through about the archives at NCBS. It's a public collecting archive. So it's not just an archive around the center NCBS, but it's also looking at the history of contemporary biology in India. And by this, I don't mean to suggest that it's the only one. I think the country of this size should have dozens of such archives, and we're just hoping to make one small effort in that direction. Um, this is a website. You guys are welcome to have a look at it if you haven't already. Um, we have about uh, 50,000 objects that are open to the public for research, 18 collections with the oldest entries from 1901. We've just received about a dozen new collections from different parts of the country, which we're quite excited to start working on. Um, and this is the entry to the catalog page, which you, anyone from anywhere can just access and send us research requests and such. So I, I just want to give it, and this is just an example of what a catalog page looks like. Uh, it's, it's, it's fairly detailed structure. So uh, just a, if you haven't visited, just a couple of quick glances. I mean, if you visited NCBS before, you probably recognize this as being Obey Siddiqui's former office and lab, which has been reconverted, which has been converted into an archive. Um, so just a quick few slides. Uh, students especially love this divan. So sometimes they just come and hang out to read a book in the archives, which is what we really, we really want to do. We want people to say, just come and hang out with us in the archive. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things now that you know we have to think about when we say the word archive, we have to ask ourselves some of these questions around time that you know where do we think the archive begins, resides, or ends? Um, and where does the story begin, reside, or end? And I don't necessarily intend to give you answers to these questions, but just leave them as provocations to sort of think about. Um, and the other thing to think about is space that, you know, when we say the word archive, you know, whose material are we saying will enter the archive? Who's going to describe it? Who interprets it? 
when does curation become the archive? And so there are so many sort of uh, what you can call the politics of the archive, like who gets to enter the archive for posterity is, is I think a very sort of long question that remains unanswered in, in a ways. Um, so when I get back to this question of archives and time about you know when does it start, begin or end, um, I want to just go back to the front door of the archive at NCBS just to give you a little glimpse, um, which is that it's it we've just put the word archive in as many languages as we could find. Well, not as many. These are all the languages that are you know that have written scripts in India that we could find on the currency note. There are various others that we haven't covered, which is why there's a large door waiting for that. And we also covered the languages of you know immigrants to the country over the past millennia or so. So you'll find Hebrew, for instance. You'll find Dutch. You'll find Danish. You'll find Portuguese. Uh, you'll find Greek, which is the origin of the word archives, which is archaea. Uh, but what you would find, especially in the language that you recognize here, is that it's, it's quite hard to capture what a word archive means. Um, that in so many other languages, in 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 uh, in Urdu, for instance, I think it's muhafiz khana, which is you know a space, you know a treasure house in a sense. Um, in Hindi, I think it is uh, abhilekhagar, a space for letters. In uh, Tamil, I think it's avanagapakam, it's a, you know a safe space for documents or something like that. But these are all very different meanings, right? So the, the word archive, if we see its origins, comes, you know, Derrida talks about it in his, in his book, Archive Fever, where he says, you know, the word archive is both a commandment and a commencement at the same time. That, uh, and I'm an etymology geek, which is why you see all this stuff here, that the word archive, you know, has the same origin as the word archivum, you know, hence archives, anarchy, monarchy, architect, you know, there's a certain sense of a, a, a hierarchical relationship, you know, comes from the word archon, which were the Greek chief magistrates who were involved in gathering the records of the of the city, uh, and then there, of course there is the other archaea, which is you know the beginning, hence archaeology and such. But I think it's useful to not think of the archive as either being a center of commandment or as a center of commencement or beginning. And it's for me, it's just much more useful to think of the archive as always being in the middle of a story. This is all I'd like you to leave. I mean, leave you with right? that. Uh, and I say this because in the late 90s, when the internet had really started to sort of become full stream, you know, visible to everyone, it was a publicly usable tool. Um, there was a conversation around by Lev Manovich in a journal called the Millennium Film Journal, where he called the database as a symbolic form. And he said, he argued that the database and the narrative are natural enemies that competing for the same territory of human culture. And I think I find the statement to some degree problematic and I'm being provocative here. And I think that the database, which is the archive, and the narrative, which are the stories that develop from the archive, in my opinion, are actually co-conspirators. That they don't necessarily play against each other, they play for each other. Without the archive, there is no story. Without the story, there is no archive. So I think they need each other's existence in a way. So uh, just to sort of uh, amplify this, uh, what I've just shared with you, um, there are the archives and there are the narratives, and then there are the interpretations that are at the heart of how you get to these narratives. Uh, by word interpretations, I you know mean as broad a thing as a search query, as a hashtag. You know, if you're a 17 year old using Instagram, or I, you know, you could talk about it as a semantic web. If you're a postdoctoral scholar in computer science, it doesn't really matter. But for me, all of these are ways of seeing the material. Right. And I want to complicate this picture that I'm showing you right now by saying that I think the the picture is a little more nuanced, where you start to realize that narratives give rise to objects, some of which have the possibility of entering an archive, which when interpreted lead to further narratives, which spark different kinds of memory, which lead to newer objects being created. And that is the general cycle that comes in here. And it's important for us to remember that the archive is not about the past. And the registrar just mentioned that, you know, when we think of the archive, we think of history. And I think that is a really problematic space. And it's something that I haven't, uh, it's, I'm deliberately not using the word so far because I think the archive is really about the present and the future. It's about how we make sense of the past in the current and for the future. And so for me, this heuristic I found to be useful because it really sort of shows how the archive is in the middle of many different stories. And it will always be in the middle of stories. Um, Carolyn Steedman sort of said it much better than I could ever. And she says, you know, the, that they're always holding everything in media res. And uh, she said that your, your craft is to construct a social system from a nutmeg grater, a phrase that is just sort of etched in my mind when I think about how she's thinking about you, how you derive meaning from all these data points that you find in the archive. Um, so a couple of quick sort of um, questions as you think about your daily, I mean, daily material that you create every day, right? So what enters the archive? I read this almost a year, actually a little over a year ago today in the New York Times, where they talked about more than almost a half a million closed circuit television cameras in the city of London 
more than any other city except Beijing. And they were talking about this was part of an article that talked about British, Britain's acceptance of surveillance. And I wanted to pause in this moment for a little bit and ask myself, what from this is going to enter the archive? Right? The New York Times snippet that I have shared with you will enter the archives of the New York Times. The closed circuit television cameras, perhaps one of them might eventually enter a museum of closed circuit television cameras or technology. The administrative documents that went into buying these cameras might enter the archives of the, the London you know, municipality, if there is such a thing. Uh, the early conversations from saying, let's have more surveillance, let's do this, might feature in an oral history interview, which might be recorded by the British Library. So you start to see that there are so many small things that can come. And now, I mean, and I've not even talked about the actual data, the reason why this was done, the 24 seven constant footage that is there on these cameras, which are typically erased every hour or so, right? And so this is what's happening in our constant attempt to document everything that I think in the end, what remains in the archive is what we curate, what we deem to be important. And this is, this is generally, I mean, I'm stating the obvious things here, but it's, it's an under understood uh, point that the archives, the first creator of the archival material is, is you. You are the person who's deciding what is going to enter in the archive. So um, I, I sort of say that we document a lot, we observe very little and we curate even less. Right, and this is perhaps most visible when we think about the photos on our smartphones, for instance. So there are various kinds of archives and I don't want to sort of go into these other spaces, but just to, I mean, the one that we are all, you know, very, very familiar with is perhaps the word archive as a verb. You know, when we talk about emailing, uh, email archives or our online drive archives and so on and so forth. There's archives as justice, as is the case in the People's Archive of Rural India, the response to a gap in the mainstream media. There is archives as digital humanities, as is the case in the variety of archives around famous individuals like Gandhi, Kabir, and Shakespeare. And then there is, of course, there are you know, platforms like Instagram and Snapchat and such where you know, things are said to be ephemeral. Um, but I want to talk here a little bit about archives as memory as well, right? About you know, what doesn't get recorded and you have to go back in time to record it. And this happens so often at science institutions because so little gets recorded from the people who are carrying out the work on a day-to-day -day basis, but don't get to feature on a journal article. Um, and so here's an example of the Apartheid Archives project in South Africa at, uh, in the University of, at, in, in Johannesburg, where uh, they've collected these histories from a variety of people. They have you know, blocked out the names of the people for confidentiality, and they've just talked about them in terms of their profiles. And each of these interviews gives you a sense of what it was like to live in that time frame. Right, you know, a narrative account my interactions with racism from a male colored in his 30s, an academic NGO activist originally from the Eastern Cape. Right? I, I share this with you because I think it's useful to think a little bit about this idea of memory and forgetting. And uh, there is there's a, a phrase in Milan Kundera's book where he talks about this thing, where he says that the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, to destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have somebody else write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history, and before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. And is it really true that a nation cannot cross a desert of organized forgetting? Right? And I think it's useful for us to just keep this in mind that uh, is it possible? And is it possible for us to create archives which systematically make us forget what the quote unquote real past was? Um, I have a slightly more sort of uh, optimistic view of the future, which is to say that you can never escape the archive. You can, you know, you can find ways to erase, you know, modify, fabricate um, all the big capital A archives, which are the institutions, but eventually over a period of time, the small A archives, these are the memories that people catch, you know, keep with them, will always catch up and will be visible to the future. And we just have to figure out ways to look for these many, many small A archives and find ways to make them visible to the world in the future. So uh, I'm just gonna give you now three constructs in the way to think about archives as public spaces, right? So one is archives as innovation. The second is looking at the archives as a commons for the people. And the third is the archives as crucible for education going forward. So when we, a um, couple of tools that we developed in the archives here at NCBS um, as innovation was, we tried to play around with this idea of how to tell stories from the archival material. Uh, this is an example of a story looking at the history of the center. Um, uh, looking at it uh, in what we call the 13 ways, which is based on uh, Wallace Stevens's poem called 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. And it has these various sections to it. So I don't, I don't want to go too much into it because I think I might've shared this uh, at, with an audience in DIFR in 2017. Uh, but there are various tools that we have put together here where you can start thinking about archives from different perspectives, You know, where you start to see 
uh, stories emerging from the time metadata for an object. So, you know, what happens after what? This is the most common way in which one might look at history. Right? Um, or here is one where we started to populate the spaces with archival objects. So we call it space tour. And it's a little bit like doing Google Street View with history, where you walk through a space and you start to see what are the different archival objects in that space, what are the stories around those objects, and we sort of interplayed with these ideas. So we taking different kinds of archival objects, mashing them together to try and tell a story. Keep in mind, this is not an archive, this is a story. And we have to make those distinctions very clear. Um, here's an example of something that we call peopleplex, which is essentially every node that you see in the steroid here is, uh, is an oral history interview, and it's an excerpt from that. This one, the one that's being showcased right now is an excerpt from P. Ishwar, who was the head cook um, at the canteen on this campus. And uh, he's been with the campus for many, many years. And so the, the intent for this toroid here or these, this network is to show how do you connect one person to another person? How do we make the connections more visible and relevant to say that this scientist is connected to this particular technician through these processes? Right? And so we, you know, we're trying to make that invisible science a little more visible to say, you know, what does it mean to support science? And you know, what is your own conception of the science that happens at your institute? Uh, and by the way, these tools that they're using here were not meant for these stories. We just found them on the open source web. This is a tool made by Christopher Manning, and he was interested in something called, uh, I mean, he was interested in Hamiltonians. And so we just decided to take it because we thought it was a good fit for telling stories. Um, and then we, of course, have various narrative themes in this, and uh, you can just have a look at it. This is a conversation around how the architecture of this campus came up. Right. So. Um, as we think about innovative tools, as I mentioned earlier, I talked about the, the space between archives and narratives as being rooted in interpretation. That, you know, how do you describe the material? And this is what I'm trying to uh, share here in this slide, which is that, you know, this is uh, an excerpt from an oral history interview with uh, Mitra Das Panikar, again, a name that is probably familiar with, uh, to some of you, where he talks about early stem cell research in the mid 90s um, uh, in TIFR and uh, in the new center uh, at the TIFR center in IAC. And so uh, in this interview, we start to see a whole lot of other conversations that are being spoken about. And we said, you know, why don't we play with this idea of interpretation and, you know, build tools for the public to start tagging and annotating these objects so that you with your own sort of world experience can listen, see, uh, read an archival object and add your interpretations to it. That the archive should not be limited to the archivist's interpretation because that after a point is very restricted. It, you know, all of these interpretations are from a certain point of view. So why don't we let these different interpretations coexist? Because I think the, the, the thing that happens here is that these keywords, these descriptions, these, ent these are the entry points to doing research. And from these entry points, you start to sort of gather meaning from the data that you've collected together, right? And so in a sense, you're also sort of thinking a little bit about the production of knowledge that, you know, if you don't have a diversity of interpretations, you don't have a diversity in the production of knowledge either. So this is basically what we're trying to address by building dynamic annotation tools so that you can go a little further um, in the way you interpret the archive that, you know, you might see, you know, a painting, I might see uh, a civil, you know, we're both looking at the same painting in a museum and we see it very differently and this happens so often. And this is really what we want to sort of amplify in the tools that we're building. Uh, so if there are any people out there who are, you know, semantic web scholars, I'd love to hear from you because these are things that we're engaging with quite actively right now. And so phase three is really sort of a space where we're connecting all of these together. And it's a platform that we call Milli. Um, there's a website for it, milli.link, which I encourage you to check out. It's fairly bare bones space, but it's, it's a space towards setting up a consortium. Um, and in, you know, it's a Millie is what we say in individuals and communities coming together and they're all interested in the nurturing of archives. What we're trying to do is we're trying to go towards an open network of archives. Uh, the word comes from, you know, largely from an Icelandic word, which means to be in between, which is really sort of our way of saying the archives is always in between stories. And of course, uh, the other two are perhaps more commonly known to this audience. So uh, I would stress and really argue that it would be amazing if TIFR and so many, and each of TIFR centers could be an archive in its own right. It could be a collecting archive for the public in a variety of disciplines. You know, we could have an education related archive. We could have an astrophysics archive. We could have a fundamental uh, research related archive. And there could be so many thematic archives that could come together in this consortium. So I would, uh, I would invite and encourage people to sort of think about this and, you know, Tell us if you're interested because we sort of really want to take this forward and it'll be nice to sort of do this 
as, as a group going forward. Um, one of the platforms in this that we're trying to develop is a story building prototype, which is really aimed at school and college level students to make them realize the value of an archive. Nobody cares about the archive, but everyone cares about a story that they heard that they remember, which is why I started with stories first, because that's, it's important for us to realize that archives develop stories and stories give rise to archives. So what we're thinking of here is basically a storytelling shopping cart for students to sort of pick and choose from the archive. They pick what they're interested in, they drop it into their cart, and they take it forward to develop narratives. You know, we, we build tools, show them how to build these narratives, and they go forward in sort of developing these stories. And it's a very, very simple idea, but it's not really been carried out yet. And so we, we're quite excited to sort of develop these software tools for students to sort of engage with. And all of this comes together in this really ugly looking uh, flowchart that I've shared here. But this is the broader concept for the Millie Consortium that I just shared that, you know, we could in theory think of a variety of individual pods. So a thematic archive as the archives at NCBS is, is just one of, you know, we could imagine hundreds of archives that come together in sharing their metadata, just their description, not the archival object itself, which comes in these three spaces that we describe here, that you have a space for discovery. You make the material visible for the public at large to look and find the material. You allow for tools to interpret it. So you're not only bound by the way the archive describes it. You can add your own interpretations, which will help the next researcher look at the material in, in a way that you have seen it. So it, it just helps better discovery. And you have a space to tell stories from the archive. So this might be an entry point for, say, a first year college student in geography. And they might find themselves drilling back eventually to figure out where it came from and realize it came from a particular tribal community archive in the Neil Diddies. And they see how that is connected to an interview at the archive at NCBS. And we have examples for this. So I'm not just making this stuff up. Right? So the other thing that I think we can do if we are, we are a consortium across these institutions is really open up the space and you know have a conversation in this country to say, let's think of the archive as a public space. know about these tools. Sorry, was that a question? No, that that's fine. There's some seven. Uh, you have roughly about 10, 10, 10 minutes. So yeah, so. that's great. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Thank you. So these, this is what we think as the Millie common space, right? You know, we can build these tools. We are actually working on a project on legal standards, and we'll make this document available to the public, um, thinking about how do you make archival material, um, you know, come to sort of the current standards around thinking about, I mean, how do you sort of uh, balance out open access with the, the privacy that a donor might want with uh, the rules that an archive might have? These are just things that we haven't touched upon. And you know, we don't even touch upon questions around data privacy. So we're bringing around the data protection bill. How does that address questions in the archive? So these are, these are some of the projects that we are working on. Uh, we can run a shared internship program across different institutions so students can actually start to see connections across different kinds of archives. Um, and so there's just a whole lot of stuff that we could do um, and we have the resources to do it. Uh, it's really will at this point that we need, honestly. It's not money. So um, just a quick disclaimer again to say that everything that I've shared with you right now, right? these ways of seeing that I'm seeing, which are you know at the heart of the archive, these are not new ideas. These go back to the older days of the card catalog of the, the libraries. And uh, some of you would recognize the card catalog. If you're, in, you know, if you're a student, you would probably ask what that is. But the card catalogs are just these elegant tools you know, in library structures to sort of make sense of the, of the material. You would often have scribbles on a card catalog by librarians where they're adding their own annotations, interpretations, call it hashtags if you want. Um, these ideas are, you know, key to the early diagrams by Ted Nelson on hypertext, and that's where the word came from, which eventually was used, with, which is used widely in the internet today. Where these ideas are very visible in Tim Berners-Lee's memo that you can see at CERN, where they're trying to basically build a nice relationship diagram. Um, it's very evident in Mark Anderson's email here from 1993, where you know uh, he's asking folks if there are ways to build annotation tools for a browser. An idea, by the way, that is still not quite um, settled. I mean, there are tools like Hypothesis, but web annotations are still, you know, an area that are still being explored as as current uh, technology. So it takes many years to develop some of these ideas. Right? So, and the most common way in which you talk about today in the library systems is it's called linked open data. So that's the most common phrase that you might find. So I'm just going to touch upon these last two topics very quickly, which is to say, think of all of these to come together as archives as a public space. Um, 
I say this because of this particular quotation from Terry Cook's article on the archive being a foreign country. And he says the archive is a foreign country to many historians. Um, it's a place that they visit, but they see it as a, as a tour guide, you know, and the guide is typically the archivist. And I'm thinking, if, if he sees the archive as being a foreign country to historians, what does it mean for the rest of us who are not that, right? I mean, it's, it's alien. None of us ever visit the archives, especially, I would argue that us, we who, I mean, uh, those of us who are in science don't visit our own scientific archives very often. And I, th I think that's, uh, it would be great to sort of change that if we can. And the other thing to keep in mind here is that the reason why we are constantly thinking about diversifying the interpretation is that the archivist is always co-creating the archive. They're making decisions of what enters the archive and what doesn't. So the, the creation of an archive is always a political act in the broadest sense of that word. So the way we imagine the archive, you know, the, to use the word park as the registrar did, is to really think of the archive at the center of being, of the center of these different silos, you know, the scientific research. This is the broad community of science, scientists, technicians, engineers, everyone. There are historians of science who use this material to develop theories. There are the storytellers, the broader other storytellers, like writers, poets, artists. Um, and then there is the broader society. So, and we think the archives really should be a gathering ground for these different kinds of individuals. And this is something that we've started to see in a public lecture series that we run uh, uh, every month, uh, at least the ones in person, that you start to see this sort of mingling of people from different backgrounds coming together uh, to have a conversation around the topic that was being discussed that month. Uh, we think this is possible. So we you know there's a student who actually made this diagram as part of her internship in the archives where she sort of drew a map of the archive. Uh, and we really see it as this sort of gathering space. Um, the only thing that we tell people is that there's no coffee allowed in the archives. Uh, and I'm going to skip this because I've just mentioned this point, but which is that you know, the archivist is always perpetuating the, the political and economic status uh, by simply going about their ordinary business. So I think it's important for the archivist to also challenge their preconceived notions of what enters the archive. And so you need a variety of people in the archival sort of program, you know, whether it's external reviewers or whether it's students who are saying my material should belong in the archive. So it's important to realize that the archive, to, to be in the archive is a way of saying I matter. And so this question of who matters is something that we have to really constantly probe uh, when we build an archive. So uh, to getting to this point of the students, I think the archive is an underrated crucible for education. And we have seen this in the 48 students that we have worked with since August 2017. And they come from you know, about a dozen, more than a dozen different disciplines. And they're extraordinary with the questions they have asked us and the way they challenge us with um, very, very basic questions around what enters the archive and what doesn't. So it's an open call that we've had. And uh, I really encourage this uh, for a variety of archives in the country that we could actually you know, share ideas and develop a common internship program as well. And these are students as young as school students and as old as postdoctoral scholars. So we have people from 18 to 38 in a way. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to all the people, uh, all the students. I mean, most of the names that you see here are students, some of them are not, but about 75 to 80% of the names that you see here are the students who basically shaped the archive over the last two and a half years. And without them, this work would not have happened. Um, so I'm really grateful to this community. I mean, and, and this group of people that you see here are artists, scientists, engineers, um, graphic design students, education students, law students. So we had a law student work once with us where we developed a, an essay that she had to work on, um, looking at what happens when archival material is made widely accessible. What are the repercussions from a legal angle? Uh, and she was a first year student in law. So now I don't expect these students to become archivists. Actually, I would say of the 48, maybe two or three are really thinking of a career in the archives. But I just hope that no matter what, they have entered an archive for once in their life. And you know, 30 years later, they will hopefully remember it. And 50 years later, hopefully they'll remember to start giving stuff to an archive. That I think everyone has the capacity to give material to an archive. Um, I'm just wrapping up to say that I want to give a shout out to all the institutions that have given a hand. Um, the archival community is extraordinarily generous and I'm just grateful that they included um, me and so many others in the fold. And they've just been constantly helping us with, you know, one of them in particular, I have to give a shout out to the, where is it? the San Francisco library, I think. Yeah, I don't know where it is, uh, this one, which literally sent us a box of goodies when they heard that we were setting up an archive and they said, you know, just here's your starter kit to think about conservation in the archives. Um, it took forever to clear it through the post office uh, customs. That, that was the only problem uh, in India, but otherwise it was brilliant. 
Um, and I'll wrap up with a story because I like stories. Um, this is another archival object at NCBS in the archives. It's part of the Siddiqui papers. It's got an ID, as you see now, MS1-13731. And this is the envelope. You can see the fragments of a paper clip that we had to remove and stuff. So you'll see all sorts of small details that you know. once you start looking at it, you can't stop. Uh, someone's misspelled Kolaba. But this was a letter that was sent to O. Siddiqui at the IFR in Bombay. Uh, this was in 2000, I think. Um, and this, so if you notice, there wasn't much here for the post office to work with, but they eventually you know, tracked this down. But the person who sent it, Hanan Ali Chachan, was very careful about you know, sharing his details, Department of Mathematics, University of Mustan Syria, Baghdad, Iraq. And that's where it came from in 2000. Right? And uh, Hanan Ali Chachan is a very interesting person. I started to you know, track him down. He's still around. I couldn't, he's not responded to my emails yet. So if any of you know him, it'll be grateful if you can connect me to him. Uh, and um, he writes to Obed saying, dear sir, I'm pleased to send you this letter, 20th March, 2000. Uh, and I'm writing, I'm doing my thesis in the field of functional analysis. You know, he's working on the Leslie matrix. Things that clearly you start to read as if you were Obed, you would probably read this at some point. You're like, you know, what is this guy asking me to do? Because those of you who know Obed would know, of course, that he's a biologist and probably understands not close to nothing about what is being spoken about here. So this letter comes to him. Now look at the dates, 20th March, 2000. Three months later, perhaps, May 26, 2000, Obed writes a response back to Hanan. These are all documents that we've, you know, just tracked down. And, you know, Hanan would not feature in any archive generally, but there's a certain, you know, charm to this letter, right? So Obed writes a letter to uh, Hanan Ali Chachan saying, I've left Bombay, now I work at the TIFR Center in Bangalore. I am not a biologist. I think there's a typo there. And not for Obed, uh, you know, giving small references. He's directly suggests that, you know, I, I suggest you write to Professor M.S. Raghunathan, FSR, you know, FRS Professor of Mathematics at TIFR about your interest. He's an eminent mathematician. He can best advise you about what you can do. Now, I'm not sharing this because, no, I don't know what happened after this. I don't know if Hanan received this letter. I've tried to ask him. You know, it's, it, his email address is available, but it's just so hard to track. And this is not old history. Right? We're talking about something 20 years ago. So very, very recent that way from the archival perspective. But what amazes me about this is really this, there's a certain unlikeliness, right? That there's a letter from a student, and I tracked them out to see that you know Hanan had actually not spent. Uh, I mean, he had to skip college in between. I think because of um, some of the wars that had happened. Um, this was sent just before the September 11th attacks, so probably that also took a toll on his education life. But somewhere in in between that time, you know, Hanan, you know, is studying mathematics, sends a letter from Iraq figures out he just knows this much about Obed, sends a letter off and is just desperate to connect to someone. And there's a letter that is responding back to him, right? And when I look at documents like this, what I'm left with is basically this quotation by Simroska, the poet, the Polish poet. And she says, you know, and this was part of her Nobel lecture uh, when she won the Nobel, uh, like a prize for literature. And she said, the world, whatever we might think of this measureless theater to which we've got reserved tickets, but tickets whose lifespan is laughably short, bound as it is by two arbitrary days, whatever we might think of this world, it is astonishing. And I think that's what the archive object constantly tells us, that the world is just truly astonishing. So I thank you for your time and I will stop here right now. Thanks, Venkat. Uh, thank you very much uh, for really taking us very interesting uh, mix of uh, things. Of course, not only the wonderful work that you and your team has done at NCBS, but uh, also uh, throwing, uh, you know, kind of challenges in some sense, also possibilities for building something which is, uh, you know, archival archive, archive is not just as if, you know, it's some uh, museum or it's a piece of place of work, place of uh, objects where you store, but the way you actually made it uh, to, to connect with the things that we do. Also, especially the importance of what we do and you know, whether or not the last example where you actually give a story of Obed is very, very interesting. And I, of course, I really don't know as institute at large, uh, and as uh, George mentioned in the beginning, maybe there are some initiatives that are going to kind of come up. But yes, maybe for many of us who are reasonably old in the institute, things like what he said about the first computer uh, the TFR built, or also many other things are not traceable, is something which we feel very bad about it. Uh, but thank you very much for, uh, you know, this very, very interesting lecture. And uh, let me see if, uh, if there are some questions. 
to the speaker. Yeah, we do have one uh, right away. Uh, yeah, Koti, can you ask? Yes. The... Yeah. Hi, Venkat. Very interesting lecture. I really enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, so you mentioned that basically there is a big distinction between storytelling and archiving things, right? And also you fill the gaps how exactly a story actually becomes a narrative, mm -hmm. you know? For example, in research field like us, where we do science, there are certain rules by which actually we play day to day and then uh, conduct our uh, duties. But as an archivist, so what are the set of rules you actually you follow? How do you know that a certain thing or event or a person uh, is, is an archiving material or not? Ah, okay. Um, okay, so I mean, this is an entire field, yes. Uh, so the way it in general, the way what, what I tell the students who work with me is, I mean, there are entire books that give you guidelines. So at a very practical level, every institution will have a retention schedule. So when I'm so there are various kinds of archival objects, right? There is administrative stuff that comes as a process of the, you know, the structure and function of an institution like TIFR. And TIFR has a records retention schedule, which is largely decided by the administration. And if there was an archive, there will be an archivist and so on and so forth. But the papers of a scientist, you know, or, or the or the material that we get, like you know, Ajit Kumar's uh, Braille document, the way I mean, these are things that generally my rule of thumb in general when I tell tell people is you you look for things that are first of all rare or unique. The archive is not a space generally to keep published material, right? So yeah. your your published papers will will get into the library. They will always you know get recorded in the journal that is collecting those or publishing those papers. But it's it's the field notes, it's the lab notes that are kept in the archives. Uh, so you look for things that are rare, unique. You look for things um, that are so so rare is different from unique. So now even an annotated scientific article. So for instance, if you were to write, you know, you have you know people would keep reprints. Of course, I don't know how many people keep reprints these days. But you know, at least in the historic records, you'd have tons of reprints in most people's offices. Uh, and reprints would typically not be kept in the archive unless they are heavily annotated by the individual. Uh, so this is broadly what is called uh, marginalia, that you look for what is written in the margins of the material to try and infer what this person is thinking about. So um, the ground rules are basically you look for things that il illuminate context and process, and you look for things that I think enable a diversity of stories. And I realize I'm giving you a slightly broad answer, but I find these two frameworks useful in thinking on the spot. When I look at something, I ask myself these two questions. You know, does it, if, is what I'm looking at going to enable a diversity of stories? And is what I'm looking at really giving light to the context and process of this individual, this institution, this corporation, whatever it is. Uh, and then of course there are various other rules that, you know, I say that there, are, there is a retention schedule, there would be guidelines of, you know, what you can't keep. So private records like bank records, you typically don't keep. Yeah, I know. Unless the individual wants you to keep it, medical records you don't keep. Um, I know I'm not answering your question directly, but because it's a very large one. No, no, I understand. It's it's a it's, it's, the field itself is very complex. I would say maybe kind of little bit of detective job is also a part of your thing. So you have oh, to really trace back. You have to trace back uh, uh, basically the history yeah. Uh, around yeah, yeah. the around the story around the object. Yeah, yeah. and it's. Fascinating. I mean, that, that that detective work is what you live for, really, because you're just like constantly hunting down how did this happen, correct, and correct. through the process you find so many other things. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you, Venkat. Thank you. Uh, so let me take a couple of more questions from uh, on the chat window from uh, Zoom. Uh, uh, this is the first one is by Alak Alak Ray, uh, Professor Alak Ray. The registrar made reference uh, to the early history of TIFR. It's also connected with the history of AC and DAE DRC. Dr. Karpatkar, before he retired in 2009, assigned some space to create an archive of DAE AC. Uh, however, there is still no, uh, still none so far. Okay, history of TFR itself uh, be enriched by material hiding in DAE files. Could the, it's a long question, could the consortium of TFR archives contemplate joining forces with DAE and help them and each bring this about? Uh, first part of my question is not delayed. Okay, so uh, so this, yeah, uh, no, this is right. And I would say actually, I don't know if the, I think the the TIFR archivist is here. She could probably also weigh in. But 
if I remember right, there was a request from the DA. I think they had plans to set up an archive. Um, and for sure, if they're interested, we'd love to work with them and figure out a way to make their material visible or uh, accessible to the public. Uh, now, we, we don't know if, uh, where the DA stands. I mean, so I think the short answer to your question is, could the consortium do this? Yes. Uh, what will it take to say yes? That's what it will take. Um, so if, if they're... If, you know, if you know folks at the DAH, please, um, um, yeah, tell them. I don't know if George uh, want to add anything in this. Uh, not, I, I'm, I'm not also sure how much uh, they do with the archives in DAE, but they had given us some space for keeping some of our materials there. And uh, at some time, a few years ago, they said that that space is no more available. So we had to actually get back all the stuff from there. And so now we have stored them in our archives here. And uh, and also at that time, of course, Babia would say after this, she would be able to contribute something. And uh, during that time when we were shifting, I think a lot of sack full of stuff we shifted from there to here. And I think it's around the same time that we also got a table of Homi Baba from his residence, which is, which is now raised down. And which we have actually displayed uh, in the lobby in the auditorium. Uh, I would request Babia to say something about the DAE and uh, what information or what uh, archive value things that I mean that we have about uh, DA and also if there are some things which DA is doing and then we can actually have a tie with them. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Hi, Venkat. Uh, so the thing is that, uh, you know, for the longest time uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, it seems that cordially that very much is an interest to have an archive in DA and uh, have a collaboration and have us work there. I mean, like you said, you know, previous staff actually worked in the DA offices for our archives. So there seems to be a, you know, like a nice uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, need and desire to do it. But I don't know uh, where the actual working on an archive for DA gets lost because uh, the, the ironic part is that, you know, uh, for us, we, we can, as Professor Alakri very clearly said that, you know, TIFR's history, we might unravel a lot in the DAE archives. But the funny thing is that DAE comes to us for archival material, you know, more often than not. So this, this and when they come, you know, they say, you know, this is great, we must also do something on RN and we offer our full support. But the actual uh, taking place of the work of going to the archive in DAE, setting it up somehow, I think it's, 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 it's you know, it's, it's not something the staff as the archivist here we can do, but the higher authorities need to give us permission to carry out from DA and TFR. But there seems to be complete interest from both sides. <clears throat> Say at the end, there is complete interest on both sides. Yes, because like I said, the funny thing is that, you know, we feel that we will find a lot of value of TFR information in the DA archives. But the DA themselves come to us when they want archival material, you know. So uh, there's some yeah. disconnect there in terms of what we can get from them, how we should go about it, how we can help them and sort of uh, develop both archives simultaneously and, you know, just have basically we, uncover we, all the material there. Have we any time tried to actually get into those files? Have they permitted us to do? I mean, there could be a lot of problem because uh, pure government organization have their own. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, own so actually, that is the attitude they have. I mean, I, I've mm -hmm. been worked in pure government organizations. So the uh, archival interest uh, comes in the last, uh, you know, if for maximum they could feel is, you know, like a government officer, you have a stack of files catching dust. More than that, they may not, they say, that, okay, we are supposed to keep files, we will record them. I mean, we'll uh, uh, keep them safe. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I don't think uh, by their own or any mm -hmm. government organization would do unless there's so a... Officially, thing. officially, definitely there has to be something. They have to tell us that we want you to come and look at the files. Only then we can enter. We've offered our full support, but officially we've not been invited anytime recently to look at their files. You're right. Uh, so uh, there are two more questions, so we should take them up. And if there is more time, we can come back to the discussion. Uh, so let us take uh, just a minute. Uh, yeah, Sandhya, I think uh, she can even ask directly if you would like. Uh, you are on, I think, Zoom. Sandhya Kaushika. Uh, yes, thank you. I really like your talk. I had a procedural question or a more research type question. Um, nowadays, a lot of the com communication and archival material, I'm assuming, is going to be electronic. Like you ended with a beautiful story of Obed responding to someone 
in a letter format. These will, of course, exist even when the person has passed on. But with electronic communication, that might not quite be the same. So how does the archivist sort of collect and preserve and even identify the sources of these sorts of data? And how has that changed the archivist versus moving into a completely electronic means of communication? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's great, Sandhya, that you're asking this, uh, because I think that the simple answer from the archivist's perspective is that it's actually no different at all, um, which is to say that this is these are just media for information, right? That you're, we're basically going from paper to, you know, magnetic particles, effectively. Um, that's that's really what the change is. You know, we, we went from papyrus, you know, we went from tablets to papyrus to paper and so on and so forth. So uh, at least that's the way the archive will see it. Now, I think what is, so for instance, so a couple of quick points. Obed wrote a paper letter in 2000, but I'm almost certain we can't find it. But um, I mean, most of you perhaps knew him, um, not very comfortable using the computer, had a secretary to whom he would dictate notes. That secretary would write it back. He would edit the write up. Then the secretary would write it on a computer, share a printout. He would edit the printout. Then that would then get edited, and then the email would go out. It was a very slow email, right? Um, but even even in this case, it might have happened. But I think when you when you ask, you know, how will it change? Um, fundamentally, there are tools to crawl email records and keep them as part of your digital archive, right? So your email records are actually much simpler to handle because they already have the metadata captured in them. They'll have name fields. You have access to it, right? How would you even have access to it? Because let us say someone retires at 60, 65 or something, and right. you just be lost. They, nobody keeps these things. Well, that may depend on the institutes. That is part of the institute's records retention schedule. That really should be part of the retention schedule in some ways. Uh, in to, uh, of course, it may not be part of the administrative schedule, but at some point, it's something that we should think about. Um, so at, uh, at this center, at NCBS, I'm, I think I've spoken to them and asked them. I think they keep faculty emails. They don't delete. Uh, so all faculty email records are kept as is. At least that's kept on the server. Um, and they'll have access to it. So for instance, uh, we haven't gotten it yet, but we'll have access eventually to, you know, Obey Siddiqui's email records through, you know, the family and through uh, uh, the administration. And so it will be made available if, you, if it is your institutional ID. Now, if it is your personal ID, you're right. We can't do much about that because that's, you know, if, if people are carrying out um, professional work on a personal ID, it's not something that you have access to. That's, uh, but, Yes, you have access to it if uh, because an extra of kin can give you access to the passwords and such. Uh, I mean, it's slightly more complicated in getting access, but it's far simpler in actually cataloging it. Thank you. But I, Sandhya, but I think the question that you're asking is important because the, the ball comes back in your court as the first creator of the archival material. That I think this is a slide that I had mentioned early on when I'd said that we document a lot, we observe less, and we curate even less. That I think the heart of this problem is to figure out what is it from our lives that we wish to curate and keep. So, and I think that is really what the archivist is picking up on afterwards. Um, the archivist is making not making decisions in, in your lives in the present. They're only looking at it 30, 40 years later. So um, there's a process of curation that I think is very necessary in all our lives as individuals. You know, without that, um, your archive is doesn't have the meaning that it deserves. So you know we do this invariably, right? You know we curate objects from 20 years ago, and you know every time we move houses, we make decisions. Um, we haven't, I think, figured out a nuanced way to curate our digital lives yet. So I think uh, the problem comes back to to all of us actually. Okay, uh, Venkat, uh, there are at least three or four questions, so we try to kind of speed up a bit. I don't know, Vidita, do you want to ask yourself or you want me to read? Can read it, Satya. Okay. Uh, so, could you elaborate this, Vidita? Uh, could you elaborate on the relationship between archives and museums, in particular in the context of scientific archives? A visiting exhibition dedicated to the modern scientific history of India that could be hosted by museums across the country would be valuable. Or perhaps, better still, uh, one has access one that is accessible uh, digitally. Okay. So, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Vidita. Thanks for the question. Actually, it's uh, I'm glad you asked this. Uh, the way, so 
this industry is called the glam industry because you know it's not very glamorous so it's galleries libraries archives and museums um and the distinction the right line make is that all of them have a little bit of each other in them okay um but at a very very high level for me today a science museum is a curatorial intervention it is an attempt by someone to develop a story using objects that might be in the archives of that museum so the front office of csmbs is your exhibition of what they think is interesting and relevant but they have a back catalog which is you know 90% of their collection so now how that collection is structured may depend quite a bit on what kind of museum they are so the archives at ncbs also has a gallery space which you know which is a space where we put out stories from the archive there's also a small library in the archive um we don't have a separate space that we call a museum yet uh, so but this is a distinction that i want to make that you know you think of the archive as being the space that gives rise to narratives which might be displayed in a museum front space um i don't know if that makes sense um it does it does i'm curious to know that do you see something of that nature developing anywhere in india at the moment where curated material of this kind will be accessible to the broader public rather than simply um those who already go to scientific institutions which is a smaller number of people in any case so i'm wondering how do you imagine this growing to be accessed either digitally i mean i'm thinking along the lines of shows like nova and pbs which can also condense his historical information in a documentary like format but how does this have wider reach beyond those who are visiting say a tfr or an ncbs or even a museum when they're having a specialized exhibition how do you have wider reach of something like this yeah i mean i i wish i had a good answer to your question so first i think it can and should be done um museums i mean one simple way is and i think the nc i forget the full form the nc the national center for science technology communication i can't the acronym is something i can't remember um but they do a lot of outreach across the country and no i mean very simple things like developing traveling exhibitions um actually this might be of interest to you also the the smithsonian runs a program called the sites program s i t e s um and they 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 focus on traveling exhibitions quite a bit so they provide all the tools so and, and for them it's a for profit or you know it's a it's a sustainable model so you have to they pay you know you have to pay them to use the material but we could do this here you know we if again if, if a consortium like this were to come together we could develop traveling exhibitions that are available on the web that we put the material out and individual school somewhere in the country just has to figure out a way to download it we will give instructions on how to put the material together in a particular room and that's it they so we don't need to travel they can get the material and figure out how to do it in fact this thing like this with which is a collaboration across outreach art and archives would be an amazing way to have a wider reach and send this outward into the country it's just uh, would be really valuable yeah no we could we absolutely can again and this is not expensive this just uh, we just need a few more people to come together and say let's let's do this okay. great talk my sir <laughs> thanks thank you uh one question from uh, vivek uh, tata can one have a 3d virtual reality tour experience of archival material especially with respect to apparatus slash experimental setups um sorry i'm just trying to parse the question uh, 3d virtual reality tour of archival you know um this is i, I can the link is uh, i'm not able to share the link to some degree we try to do this with the space tour um um sort of product from the archives website i'm just going to try and share the link in the chat window um so this is actually doing this we we are playing with this idea so you know if you have a space that you think can use a similar um sort of storytelling tool you you know we are happy to just tell you how to you know go ahead and use this uh, this link may not work very well if you're on a mobile phone by the way so so i'm hoping okay. you're seeing a desktop um so yeah it can happen but i can keep in mind that these would be narratives so you know students can develop narratives like this for archival material it's uh, it's very very easy to do this is open source uh, software that we used um so it's okay it's, uh, i hope i answered the question i hope yeah, thank you ha ah, yeah is there so alak uh, like, uh, i do to alak do you want to ask uh, i mean i think you have some information or uh, maybe a comment do you want to come in directly yourself 
Okay. Uh, you had one comment after uh, Bhavya, all of you, uh, you know, George and all talked about this TIFR DAE. Uh, he says the initiative has to come from TIFR. So that is the comment uh, after hearing what uh, you guys discussed. And But he also has another uh, rather comment or information. I heard about a museum of the geological history of India to be launched somewhere in Delhi slash Chandigarh area. So maybe he wanted you to can you say something if you know about this initiative? I am afraid I don't actually. I'd love to know more. I don't. I mean, I'll promptly go and search for this. I mean, does anybody else know? Can you share details if anyone in this audience knows about it? Possibly not. Uh, okay, Venkat, I also want to just uh, take one question from uh, YouTube. Uh, okay, this is slightly taking uh, things away from what you spoke today, uh, what are the uses of AI, artificial intelligence in archival management? Um, well, I mean, actually it's probably fairly close. So, um, okay, so one thing that I keep saying, so when we work with the students, right, I'm just, it's gonna be a long-winded answer, just bear with me for a minute or so. So our fundamental reason for working with students, those 48 students is not to train them as archivists. It is to make them think critically about the material, read between the lines if possible, read what's missing um, and find ways to interpret um, the, the material based on their life experiences till that point. Now, you could argue that description of archival material could be done through an artificial intelligence program of some sort. And I don't know enough about the field to comment on it, but I would just imagine that you could develop machine learning algorithms to do that. But I think at, I think this will still remain to be perhaps one of the hardest problems to solve in the world of the archives because everything else is relatively straightforward. I mean, you don't need humans to do the actual data entry, uh, but we need people to think critically about the material, to find gaps, to, to find the, you know, to find patterns in the data, which is really what we do as researchers also, right? So finding meaning in the material and figuring out ways to connect disciplines, connect the dots is really what we're trying to train and think, I mean, train the students in thinking about. Um, so I think if there is a way to crack this uh, using you know, algorithms and such, I'd love to sort of also explore that space. So that would be, I think, a really nice frontier to explore. So I uh, don't know if I answered the question, but this Yeah, question. of course he's from YouTube, so he and talk to you directly, but I read a question for you. I hope that was answered well. And uh, I, I don't see any more questions. So it's time to thank you, Venkat, for a really a very, very nice uh, talk. Uh, something very interesting. It also kind of uh, made us to think about our own kind of ways on which we are going ahead uh, with this particular important activity. And we really feel sometimes when we hear from people like you that what treasure we have actually probably lost uh, maybe some of these things are sold to a Bhangarwala, maybe. Uh, that is really sad part of it. Uh, there are, of course, realities in, term, in terms of space, in terms of, you know, what is our prime, uh, you know, activity that goes on, and et cetera. But there are, these are things which normally we give as, uh, if I can say, as an excuse. But uh, I hope there will be, uh, like what Alak uh, mentioned, and also uh, George and Avya uh, also commented about it. I hope there will be a good activity, at least if not in Kolaba campus. So Hyderabad is an opportunity where we can really set up from, you know, uh, in a big way. I hope the institute management will uh, think about it. So yeah. uh, with uh, with uh, those words, I would like to, unless George want to say anything. Uh, George, do you want to say something? No, no, no. I'm just, after you, I just wanted to thank Venkat for having. Uh, okay. So I'm done. So you can go ahead. Yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, what we thought. Uh, couldn't actually materialize in the way that we thought, but I'm sure when the new normal, we come to a new normal, we can have something rare so that I would like the grassroots people also to be aware of what is important and how it should be recorded and preserved. And of course, then the rest of the things, what we all discussed in different things. So, but it was a good talk and thank you very much. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm so I'm happy to do this on this format. I mean, we can set it up in a similar way with the different departments. So we can, you know, we can do this. Um, even on this, I mean, if they're interested, we can set it up separately with different units. Um, but I, I really hope, you know, we take upon some of these comments that have come and you know, we can 
we can work together to set up something like a like a consortium and actually develop some of these other archives that i mean i think we're sitting on treasures and it's it will be great to take this forward so thank you i, I i'm sorry uh, even though i already thank you formally but there's i realized that i missed a question from one nitanshu uh, uh, if you don't mind i want to quickly read uh, first of all thank you for this interesting session uh, as you laid this concepts of platform mili link Uh, which gives us liberty to have different point of view on the archives with respect to others point of views but wouldn't it to will result in more data to be considered and could hinder the facts in history how do you define a fact so i mean i think so nobody is arguing about um so when we say interpretations we are not saying that you know if a letter is written on january 1st 1950 then there is no ambiguity about that unless someone has fabricated the date but what we are talking about interpretations is how you come at the object so it's a little bit like looking at a painting that's the, that's the example that i try and use that some of us are interested in the brush strokes some of us are interested in the period of painting that is that you know that the the you know the the kind of style that is being used there some of us are interested in the story in the painting some of us look at the painting and say that you know i see anger when i see this painting so we come at it with our own interpretations and it's really that that i'm trying to sort of say that you know we have our own ways of looking at these objects and these are not these are not rooted in fact these are rooted in perception um and perception is very much part of this thing that we call the archive um so i'm just giving a very sort of crude example um and there are various entry points so you know i'd given that example of the panikkar uh, oral history interview that in every archival object you will have metadata or you'll have descriptions that are the high points so it will tell you who is the writer panikkar the date 2000 year you know sclays bangalore area of discussion stem cell research whatever but somewhere in that interview panikkar has briefly mentioned working with a fertility clinic right and so now this fertility clinic doesn't come into the main description points of that object but if someone is listening and paying close attention to it they can annotate the object to say that this archival object has a you know 10% relevance to the history of fertility clinics right and that might capture the interest of say a sociologist who is studying the history of fertility clinics in bombay so that that's really what i meant by you know having layers of reading um, into the material Okay, so I think we uh, you ask answered every question. So thank you once again, Venkat. Uh, thanks for all of you, and I hope one one day we'll again have uh, an event which is originally planned by George and you guys, and uh, that will be even more uh, interesting and inspiring. Thank you very much. Yeah. No. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here. This uh, yeah. quite the treat for me to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.